Yeah, so my, my role is as network coordinator with the Farmers Market Coalition, um, and I have been um, supporting the toolkit team uh, with administrative support and other resources. Um, yeah, and really excited to be here to talk with you all today. And I also want to mention that um, not here today is uh, my co-facilitator and consultant on the project, Nedra Deadweiler, who's been mentioned. Uh, Nedra is a social worker, a heritage preservationist, an advocate for human-powered mobility and diversity within transportation and preservation. Um, also, as Nina mentioned, uh, Rachel Ward um, with FMC is not joining us today. Um, she is the Farmers Market Project uh, support project manager. And um, she also um, supported Nedra and I in leading the process of creating the toolkit. Um, I think it's also in court, important and cool to mention that one of the working group members, uh, Shiny Flannery, is a part of, is it OFMA, OFMA, <laughs> and part of the yeah Oregon Farmers Market Manager community. We want to to thank uh, Shiny for all of her excellent work. She was a a huge um, champion for the work. She's always been a champion for the work. So we appreciate and wanted to just shout her out amongst her specific peers in the state. And uh, we are very excited. And um, I hope that I do. Um, all of the work justice, but certainly that I represent Shiny well today. Thanks so much, Sadrina. And so uh, to start with, we wanted to talk a little bit about how the toolkit came to be. Um, so uh, as Ashley was sort of showing in the introduction, although FMC really fully and enthusiastically um, supports the toolkit, uh, and is so excited to be hosting it on FMC's website. Um, we just wanna make sure that we clarify who did the work here. Um, so FMC did not create the Anti-Racist Farmers Market Toolkit. Sadrina Jalal and Nedra Deadweiler led the creation of the toolkit with a group of Black food systems experts from across the country, um, folks with expertise in many areas of the food system. And what FMC's role was, was really to support through funding, administration, and resources. Um, so like a lot of projects addressing anti-racism and specifically anti-Blackness, the conversation around this toolkit began in 2020, specifically as a response to the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the uprisings that followed. And partly as a response to conversations and community building with markets and members of FMC over many years. Um, so we know that the calls for farmers markets to become more equitable spaces of belonging have been happening for decades, and this is not a new phenomenon. Um, but this project specifically was made possible by relationships that already existed between FMC and Black food systems leaders, particularly between Sadrina, uh, between Sadrina Jalal and Rachel Ward, and Sadrina and our FMC uh, support director, Dar Wolnick. And I'm mentioning this in part because I think it's really important to emphasize uh, that relationship building over time is essential and foundational to creating the kinds of trust that enable work like this to happen. So because of those relationships, there was space and context for FMC to reach out to Sadrina and to ask whether these resources exist and then to build a structure for creating them. And throughout the process, we've also used our resources and infrastructure to support the work that Sadrina, Nedra, and the rest of the work group are doing um, and uh, to ensure that the work group members would be compensated for their expertise, which was a really essential part of this project. So of course, this process has not always been perfect. Um, and if you wanna learn more about kind of how the process has gone and what we learned um, about these collaborations um, in the course of the toolkit's creation, I'm gonna share a link to a blog um, that is published on the FMC website and that will tell you a little bit more about this process and the lessons that we learned there. Um, and yeah, just finally to uh, to pass it off to Sadrina um, to talk a little bit about the creation process for the toolkit. Absolutely. Uh, are we advancing slides, Nina? I just wanted to make sure that I was we're we're in the right place. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. If you could go forward a couple slides, thank you for noticing that, Sadrina. <laughs> <laughs> one more. There we go. Oh, what back? Back one. <laughs> Great. Altogether oh. possible that that was my job, so I wanted to make sure that it wasn't. So, <laughs> um, so yes. Um, oh, one more. We need to go back. One more. Perfect. Um, as 
Nina mentioned, it is critical to state um, that, and very important, and it was critical to the process that we centered this experience around relationship building and being intentional about how we gathered and who we gathered and um, creating um, a space where the work could be done authentically and um, that we allowed um, for just the diversity, even within the working group in terms of the spaces that they represent geographically, as well as the work that they do in the in the in the local in their local food system, um, and then also themselves as human beings and individuals and family members. So um, this relationship um, definitely seeds the foundation where the principles of being an anti-racist and taking action to address anti-blackness becomes. Um, possible. And I want to say that as I talk about the working group um, specifically, um, it is important to mention that relationships with people who have committed, who have committed relationships to their community in which they work um, are able to bring in multi um, perspectives, a deep sense of like connection and um, feedback and personal experiences that are nuanced and relevant. They are artisans who weave together critical component, components of the tapestry of a particular space, with the goal being to create outcomes that are reflective of and authentic to the culture, address the needs and wants of the community. And by doing so, we're creating holistic, innovative approaches designed to be integrated with the same intentionality by which it was created. And so um, one of the, um, the, the beauties of this slide, of course, are the 10 working group members who hailed from across the country. They were convened together on monthly group meetings as well as bi-weekly work sessions as needed. And those uh, work sessions did not, was a cross section of the group. So we had folks that would sign up to work on different aspects of the, um, of the toolkit together in partnership with each other. And then we had others um, who edited the work and helped us to pull it together. Um, the curated selection process um, considered regionality, diverse expertise, lived experience, and specific um, methodological approaches. We understood that we needed um, a cross-section of thought leaders to prepare um, to contribute anti-racist and cross-cultural thinking from a Black community focus. Selected members have experiences with academia, food education, consulting, facilitation, and community organizing. And all of them possess leadership within their communities and are advocates for justice systems and strong, healthy communities. So over a year of trust building, lots and lots of research, um, and we were constantly updating our research because this was a, a very intense and long process. Um, very, very deep conversations. Uh, Nina mentioned it's not a perfect project, and, but um, a perfect experience. Um, but um, we definitely found ourselves having to like consider the experience along the way and step back um, and, and hold space for those conversations. Um, tons and tons of Jamboard sessions. <laughs> um, I still dream about those at night. Um, continuous emails and shared documents. Um, all of that provided the materials needed to create the toolkit and um, really proud of, of what we came up with. Um, it's also important to note that the process of the meeting of meeting as a group inadvertently served as a space of healing and connection. There were a number of deep conversations and moments of processing um, oppressive racist experiences. And I, I need to really highlight that we were still in the middle of the global pandemic and dealing and wrestling with some of the civil unrest um, that we that our country was experiencing and the murder of uh, uh, Black um, folks at the hands of police. And so these are things that found their way into the conversation um, on a regular basis. Um, so it was a it was a very um, important space for all of us. In addition to creating the toolkit, we were able to support each other during some of the toughest times that our country you know, has seen. 
Some of the members held multiple roles within the group. And um, again, another shout out to Shiny, who worked with a smaller work group to achieve the final format of the toolkit. So last year, about this time, um, after working on it for almost a solid year, we turned it over to Shiny and um, the and about four, three or four other uh, toolkit members to put the finishing touches on it and bring it all together into the co cohesive product that you see now. And um, I also um, would be remiss if I did not mention that we have a wonderful, wonderful um, part of the team. Um, her name is Amelia Dorch, and she provided the design and the uh, the layout colors, integrating the complexity of the material in an approachable and visually appealing way. And I, um, I, I think it's important to, to note that she, she and I also have a longtime relationship. She works at the USDA. She also, she and I both are graduates of University of Georgia, and uh, we've worked on projects, community-based food specific projects together in the past. And um, her just, I knew that she would be the per person to, to bring with it kind of an, a wealth of knowledge as well as um, sensitivity to the, the needs um, for um, specific design and layout to really make sure that this was received well. And we're very happy with what she came up with. I'll turn it back to Nina. Thank you, Sadrina. Um, yeah, so with that introduction, um, we are gonna uh, advance forward one slide if you wouldn't mind, Madeline. Thank you so much. Um, so part of the intervention that the Anti-Racist Farmers Market Toolkit is making um, depends on a shared understanding of what the problems within farmers markets and within our field are. And of course, there are a million problems that anti-Blackness creates. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to intervene in here is the idea that farmers markets are regularly perceived as white spaces. Um, and this refers to the idea that farmers markets often even when they're located in primarily black and brown neighborhoods are usually frequented by a majority white and um, even a majority affluent shopper base. And that the vast majority of farmers selling food at markets are also white. And that the vast majority of farmers market managers are white. And finally, that as a result of these factors, the cultural norms and the ways that people are expected to act and to interact at markets, the music that gets played, the food that's sold, the ideals that are celebrated, end up rooted in white dominant culture. So white cultural priorities end up being prioritized at farmer's markets. And maybe the easiest way to kind of um, illustrate that and most accessible example would be kale. Um, and that's a food that was primarily reintroduced to cultural center stage in the early 2000s as a result of new attention to local foods and farmer's markets. But at the same time as kale was sort of, you know, experiencing this cultural renaissance, collards, which are a traditionally Black American staple food, have the same nutritional benefits, they have the same seasonality, they have the same variety of flavors and colors, um, and yet the focus in marketing is persistently on kale. Um, and this shows a bias for white cultural idealization, even of one vegetable over a nearly identical counterpart. Um, that differs really primarily because one of them is a staple food in African-American cuisine. So compounding this problem of farmers markets as spaces that privilege white cultural norms and ideals is a really frequent misconception that food and the spaces where food is sold are somehow neutral when it comes to race. Um, so I'm gonna play a clip from the scholar Alison Alcon talking about this phenomenon. Um, and I'm actually gonna sh take back my screen share here because I think I have to do that in order to share audio. That's all right. There we go. Thanks for that. And um, I'm going to share a little bit of a clip um, from uh, Earth Eats. So, but this I, whole idea of these kinds of farmers markets at which people value diversity, become white spaces, I think has to do with liberal white society's discomfort with race more generally. Alison Alkin is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of the Pacific. She also teaches in the food studies program there. Her first book was about the racial dynamics of food politics at a couple of farmers markets in California. 
where we want diversity. We as kind of lefty white people want diversity, but don't know how to talk about or think about race in critical ways that might actually make us change our spaces in ways that would actually be more inviting. Because what I found when I would ask vendors at the North Berkeley market or regular customers at the North Berkeley market about race, they would say things like, oh, well, we don't need to do anything special to make it inclusive. What we have is should be attractive to everybody. And anybody who likes good food will feel welcome here. And there was a real problem with that from my perspective, because first of all, they were defining people who like good food, their version of good food as good people and other people as kind of less. And then they were saying that just because they want other people to feel welcome and feel comfortable that they do. Which is to say, it's a lot more complicated than just wanting to be welcoming. And as Sharana Moore pointed out, some of it's beyond the control of any one farmer's market. All right. Thanks so much. Um, so when we hear Alison Alcon talking about um, the, this idea of welcoming spaces, um, we wanted to point out that um, this, um, this is something that a lot of us have experience with where often market managers will see the idea of local food as a kind of universal good. Um, and they'll recognize that there are not enough vendors or shoppers of color at markets, but because they see themselves as welcoming and food is a universal good. And this ends up resulting in a kind of like throwing up of hands, like we're good people, we sell good food. Um, we know that there's something wrong, but what else can we do? Um, you know, kind of what more do you want? And we believe that the problem and the solutions to the cultural whiteness of farmers markets have a much more specific and concrete set of causes and a much more specific and concrete set of solutions. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities for action and for intervention to move beyond just a general intention of being welcoming and towards a kind of specific actions that can build relationships and earn trust and create spaces of belonging. Um, so the clip that I just played is actually a uh, radio clip. So I'm gonna make sure I share that in the chat. If you'd like to listen to the entire thing, um, you can do so. Um, but for now, I wanted to play another clip from that same radio piece. Um, and uh, for context, this is called Earth Eats. It's um, aired in 2019, and it's a program that talks about a conversation that ended up opening up at a Bloomington, Indiana farmer's market after one of the vendors in the market was outed as a member of a white supremacist group. Um, so here in the clip, you're going to hear Sharana Moore, who is one of the um, Indiana-based Black Farmers Co-op leaders. Um, and she's speaking to some of the specific issues that end up keeping her community out of the market, um, it, both in terms of Black growers and shoppers in Indianapolis. I'm going to advance one slide. So there's just a couple of questions up on this slide um, that we wanted you to keep in mind as you're listening to this clip. Um, as you're thinking about kind of what Sharana Moore is saying, are the specific structural and social barriers to farmers markets as spaces of belonging for all? Asking you to think about what keeps black growers out of the Indianapolis farmers market as vendors? What keeps black customers from accessing farmers markets? And how is this idea of welcoming space that uh, Alcon was introducing made real or not real through specific actions and structures? And I'm going to play this clip. It's just going to take me one moment to get to it. As y'all can no doubt see, this does not have the most specific timestamps on this radio program. So yeah, we'll start there. And encompassing at this market. The reason that we started the Indiana Black Farmers Co-op was because when you think of farmers, you never think of Black people, especially not Black women. My name is Sharana Moore. I am the founder and CEO at Lawrence Community Gardens. 
Sharana is also one of the founders of the Indiana Black Farmers Co-op. They run a farmer's market specifically for black farmers on the east side of Indianapolis. Sharana says one of the barriers that has kept her community from selling at market in Indianapolis is a requirement for insurance policies, which are costly for small farmers. Another reason why black farmers you won't see us at the market is because white people have stolen our land over the course of time. Which means farmers in her community are growing on small urban plots a third of an acre, a quarter of an acre. They're growing enough to feed their families and their neighbors enough to give away. A lot of times they're not even growing enough to sell at the market. Um, there's some hurdles and some barriers. Not only that, for black farmers, just me personally, when I go to panel discussions and workshops and classes around farming, there are never any black people. I will mm -hmm. be one of maybe one or two black people there. Mm -hmm. And so... It steers us away because we don't have any commonality with other people in the room. The white farmers in our in our networks, um, they have hoop houses. They um, buy seeds and seedlings in abundance, and they split the cost. They have a shared cooler that they use um, that is just part of their network and how they operate. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. We don't have that type of network and those type of connections. They share tractors and tillers, and we don't have that. I can't really say it's racism. I'm saying it's a favoritism because sometimes things aren't about what you know. It's about who you know. Great. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to stop sharing, Madeline, and hand it back to you for the next slide if I can. So in both of these clips, we hear Sharana Moore and Alison Alcon talking about this idea of feeling welcome and that it's not just a feeling. Um, feeling welcome is structural, it's insurance, it's transportation, it's people who look like you being present, it's foods that are culturally appropriate, it's access to sufficient land, it's policies at market that are designed to make you sure, sure that you participate, and it's networks of support within your community that make sure you have the tools you need and uh, can be building shared capacity and it's funding. So when we say that we want farmers markets to be welcoming spaces, we're talking about building towards an idea of welcome that is based in actions and structures. And that's where the anti-racist farmers market toolkit is about um, going beyond good intentions and openness to change that are often as far as white led institutions have gone with anti-racism and pro-blackness in the past. So the good news is that you know, if we are recognizing this fact that farmers markets have been structural, uh, have been structured by policy and infrastructure and relationships um, toward this, this idea of the whiteness of farmers markets, if that's been structured by infrastructure and policy, then it can also be deconstructed, deconstructed, sorry, all can also be deconstructed by policy and infrastructure and relationships. Um, and the tools in the Anti-Racist Farmers Market Toolkit are designed to do just that, to support markets in doing that work of deconstruction. So with that, I will hand it back to Sadrina. And if we could go forward just a couple of slides. Thank you. And one more, Madeline, please. Thanks. Okay, awesome. So um, I am going to talk a little bit about the um, structure of the toolkit and um, wanted to, uh, you can see um, very clearly that we have it divided into four areas of focus and uh, we call them the four M's, um, management, mission, messaging, and measurement. And this is a structure that was created by uh, my, my colleague Dar, who is um, just an incredible wealth of knowledge and um, is part of the team at FMC. Um, she and I were uh, both consultants for a group of farmers market leaders in Louisiana several years ago. And um, it's also an example of how the toolkit is built out of a network of relationships. When I first started the toolkit of uh, the conversation with the other working group members, I wanted to make sure that we, I introduced the forums because I knew this was a structure that reflected um, 
things that farmers market leaders are familiar with um, managing at their market. And so we are really just adding in an additional layer and er area of consideration that should enhance work that they're already doing for their market. And so this was a, a really important um, consideration for the group. And we were very excited um, to be, you know, to be able to, to, um, to do to have that intention and to hopefully provide market managers with a structure that felt familiar and also um, accessible. So um, we also, um, as we started to think about the four M's, we brought it into conversation um, and we were thinking about um, different things that we wanted to make sure were being considered specific to the anti-racist aspect of each of the sections. So we wanted to break it down into discussion points. What is it? Why do we do it? Or why do it? Um, how to do it? Think about it and talk about it, which um, comes from Chinese work in moving folks from processing to action and then back into necessary processing because the work of practicing anti-racism is not linear. It's an iterative process, iterative process that one develops over time. And um, between these two frameworks, the four M's and the discussion processing sections, we found a way of approaching how to build an anti-racist anti farmers markets geared specifically to market leaders and to the move forward active um, cyclical change that supports anti-racist work. Um, this presentation by necessity is going to stay very high level. We only have so much time. So we'll be moving through each of the four M's uh, pretty quickly and we'll uh, briefly address what it may look like for farmers markets to engage in anti-racist practices around that particular M. So if we can um, go to the first slide from here, the next slide I should say. Perfect. So this slide is management and um, some important um, things to consider is that we are looking at what makes a market run. And so that includes who are the market operators, the staff, the board members, identifying the culture. How are all these entities collaborating to create the overall culture of the market through their practices and procedures? Um, and that are involved in operating and overseeing the day-to-day -day services of the market. And also what are the practices and procedures and the gaps between those two? One example um, is that we hear, we often hear um, from markets. And when I was working with Georgia Farmers Market Association, I heard this a lot, was that there are no, are very few farmers of color in the community that they support. And it is fine to acknowledge that. Um, we know that 98% of the land in the US is owned by white people. So that's not surprising at all. But what we want to push everyone to consider is what can be done in addition to acknowledging who owns the land is to think about policies that may support the growth of land land ownership among people of color, policies that will support farmers of color who may be farming in your community that you may not be aware of um, as um, BIPOC farmers, specifically black farmers, growers, um, making adaptations to their practices to that circumvent um, barriers and um, knowing that they are maybe working on smaller plots of land. Um, by reflecting on the result of U.S. history, racialized land policies and practices, and white terrorism, it becomes important to reflect what the systemic barriers are, how they're preventing Black farmers and other BIPOC farmers from growing in your area or from joining the market community. The necessary work becomes determining how your work can bring those barriers down. Anti-racist markets require managers to be thoughtful, intentional, and to have their own work around, have done their own work around anti-racism. Specific efforts include being prepared to address problem behaviors, design inclusive process, maintain equity-oriented policies, and manage conflicts as they arise in the market environment. 
This section of the toolkit will orient managers to accessing the existing culture and climate of their market and making intentional shifts towards anti-racist market culture. Anti-racism, again, is a daily practice. It's a way of life. And the anti-racist market management requires constantly applying and reapplying that practice to everyday market life. And I will turn over the next slide um, to Nina for um, mission. Thanks so much. So the next section of the toolkit is mission. And this includes an organization's mission statement, of course. It also isn't just that statement. Um, but the market's mission expresses what the market is for and what its goals are. So if the mission doesn't include anti-racism directly, um, then anti-racist work is going to seem like it's something outside of the goals of the market, right? So um, centering that mission is super important. So a lot of farmers market missions focus on social and economic goals, and they don't necessarily mention race. But as we've already talked about, food is not neutral and spaces are not neutral and economics are not neutral. So racism and anti-blackness are systemic and that means that they warp every system from economies to public spaces. And if a market's mission statement isn't incorporating anti-racist language and it's treating the systems of, for example, like the idea of a downtown or something like that as uh, race neutral, then, um, then it's not really possible to achieve anti-racist goals if you're not kind of acknowledging the ways that that pervades every system that the market is a part of. Um, so one of the things that this section does is to help markets write missions that they can then use as tools which will support their anti-racist work. And a mission statement can be a really powerful tool in resolving conflict in particular because it clarifies why conflict is necessary um, and why a given behavior might be an issue for the whole market. So of course the statement itself is a is a practice of your mission. And um, it's one of the most uh, important aspects of this section is the tools that it contains for relationship building, um, kind of beyond going, going beyond just that mission statement, including using measurement to understand the needs and context for community members and what they might need from the mission of your market. So developing an anti-racist mission statement uh, is also a focus and that requires the foundational work of understanding institutional racism, how it shows up in this work. And again, because it's an iterative process um, where you continually need to revisit language and goals of your market in conversation with the people that you wanna serve and partner with um, as relationships within your community grow stronger, new goals will become possible. And then those can be incorporated back into the market's mission. All right, so if we can go on to the next slide. Pass it back to Sadrina for messaging. Awesome, thank you. So um, messaging is what we, the term we use to refer to how an organization talks about itself. And um, I always say that if you don't control the narrative, someone else will control it for you. And so we oftentimes, if we're not conscious of the messaging that we are sharing, um, we leave it up to the imagination and the creativity. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the things that are not said that are indications to some um, of what the market experience is all about. Um, it's the words in a message and what is the underlying tone of the key points um, or what are the topics a market communicates about is really what makes up the message um, and the messaging part of um, uh, this particular, the focus of this particular part of the toolkit. Uh, messaging makes up just one part of a comprehensive communication plan. Um, other parts of a comprehension communication plan include audience selection and distribution channels. And um, that's, you know, in, in very important when we're thinking about uh, who we are communicating to and how we're communicating to those folks. Uh, messaging allows for a deep understanding of the farmer's markets brand, purpose, intentions, and is done throughout each material that comes from the market. It also goes beyond the printed material and goes to the formal. How does one feel? How does one think about a place? The messaging is what comes out of the word of mouth. What does the community say about the market? People will feel your message loud and clear. And 
I think it's extremely important to emphasize that you must go out of your way to make people, to meet people where they are rather than expecting them to show up in your space simply because you invite them. And that's probably one of the single greatest experiences um, or thought processes, I should say, that leads to limited understanding of a particular market is that the expectation is, you know, if you build it, they will come. And, um, and that's just, we just don't find that to be true. And certainly, is not true when it comes to creating a um, a place of belonging at far, at at farmers markets. Um, Anti racist markets are thinking about messaging from the beginning, and that means that we recognize that through our partners, design of space and programming, um, we are communicating something, and we must always ask ourselves, what is it that we are communicating? Um, markets are already in existence. Um, they require analyzing um, existing messaging that specifically addresses its transition into an anti-racist market. So we understand that for most of you here and uh, most of the folks that are downloading and considering using the principles of the toolkit, this is, you know, this is something that has been a part of your community. Your market has been a part of your community for some time. And so, um, you know, it's it's going to really depend on um, taking the time to analyze and to consider how those shifts need to be done. Um, and so in doing, you know, when you do that and you analyze, then that is absolutely going to create a, a focus on your market. And so what we can do is we, again, you get ahead of the narrative. So be transparent about the process and allow the opportunity for the community to hold you accountable for, to determine goals and you know, that are reasonable and attainable and time sensitive. Um, intentionally state that your market is examining these things and shifting towards being a more inclusive environment. That's super important. Um, and, um, you know, that will let, let everyone know what the, what the, what the end result will be, even if the path to get to it is, is, um, a little bumpy. We know where we're going. Um, and, um, I also want to just kind of mention some keys to creating an inclusive experience. Um, promotional materials are a very big reflection of what's happening. And um, that's, you know, that's a, a really great opportunity to just think about things like, you know, we talked about in the design of the toolkit that we use a graphic designer that could consider how can we make sure that even in the the color and the design and the structure of the toolkit was cult culturally relevant and um, may actually lend itself to being, um, being um, you know, well received and, um, you know, by, by Black food systems leaders and recognizable, um, those characteristics being recognized. And we've actually heard that that is the case. Um, and messaging starts with programming um, and the cultural culture that is represented at the market and how you embrace the culture around you. Um, make sure that you're thinking not only about what, what is in the messages, but how and where they're being delivered. So um, I always share one of the markets that I help to to support is um, and to help develop itself. It was going through a, it had shut down for a year and it was opening again and rebranding. And um, the community itself um, is 60% um, Latinx and, but the shoppers at the market were 95% white. And um, so we really had to think about where was the messaging and how was it being presented? to the community in a way that made it feel inaccessible and uninviting to um, a, a cross-section of the culture there in the community. And um, also um, there are lots of other ideas um, that we can um, share, but I wanna make sure, and maybe we could even share in the chat, but I wanna make sure that Nina has a chance to hit measurement because we are running short on time. Thanks, Adrina. Yes, we can go there, awesome. Um, 
So measurement is the last M. Um, and of course, you might have noticed as we've gone through the whole presentation, we've talked about the need for measurement in every single section. So just like anti-racist work, the toolkit is not a linear experience. We've said iterative, I think, at least once every couple of minutes. And we expect that readers will return to sections, skip ahead, skip backwards in order to implement these practices. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a start on page one end on page 57 type of deal. Um, so measurement is how you know exactly what is working and what needs revision. Um, establishing clear and realistic methods for assessing your market will support your market management in terms of knowing if and how the changes that you're implementing are creating a more inclusive, are, are actually achieving this goal of creating a more inclusive market. And they'll also help um, management teams to stay accountable to the market community. Um, and that's a that's a really important aspect of this in terms of accountability. Like, what does that mean and look like? Um, so one aspect of it is that your measurement shouldn't just focus on quality on quantitative data, um, things like sales and numbers of customers. It should also include thinking about what the experience is like for the people who do come to market um, and also who isn't there. So uh, in the example that Sadrina just shared, if the market is in a community, um, and most of that community is not showing up. That is an important part of your measurement um, and considering why. And in addition, I think in terms of accountability, it's really important to be conscious of the history of research in communities of color and all the ways in which research processes can be extractive. So this idea of like a one-sided relationship where a researcher is kind of taking data and information from a community and not giving back um, the results, not showing how those results can benefit the community and not making sure that the needs of the community are being met by those results. So um, thinking about, um, about how many uh, communities of color have been over-surveyed, over-analyzed, um, and there has not been a benefit provided back to that community. Um, so like everything else in this, um, within this toolkit, we're talking about dialogue and relationship. Um, so make sure that you're communicating how you're going to act on the data that you collect and how uh, those actions will make an impact for the folks that you're surveying. And don't be afraid to acknowledge and report about what isn't working. Um, we shared that lessons in process blog, which includes some of those lessons. Um, courageous honesty is a really essential part of this process. Data collection has to be about telling our stories and demonstrating value. Um, so think about who you're demonstrating your value to. Uh, which is to say not just funders, but the community itself. And finally, to think about how you're collecting data and the types of tools you're using um, that can really reframe uh, many aspects of the ways, the kinds of data that you get. Um, so the toolkit is full of tools for data collection. It's really kind of taking on that, like how you collect data frames, what data you get question. And a lot of the tools can help you shift your data collection framework and focus on what is needed um, rather than what's expected out of measurement. All right. And that is our four M's. And I'm going to pass it back to Sadrina to talk about moving from learning to action. Great. Okay, um, so, um, you know, the toolkit is definitely intended to be a very dynamic um, document as well as an opportunity for full engagement. It's not meant to be something that sits on the shelf. Uh, this is a guide to action. It um, includes worksheets and thought exercises, talking points, and more. Um, and those are um, for you to take what you've learned and put it into practice. And um, also important to note that action isn't a one-time thing. The action here isn't to read the toolkit, it is to read the toolkit and start to integrate anti-racist principles into every facet of the way your market operates and to every facet of your day-to-day -day work. Um, the, um, the toolkit exists to help farmers markets make progress towards becoming anti-racist market managers of anti-racist markets. Um, and so it's important to say that the authors of the toolkit um, say that making progress because anti-racism is a lifelong commitment is an active daily practice. So that's something that we 
um, constantly reminded ourselves and um, have continued to hold space for as the toolkit has been socialized and folks are experiencing it. Um, it's going to take many, many incremental and iterative steps to make it lasting and um, to create meaningful change. And if you could advance the next slide, I'll turn it back to Nina. Thanks. Yeah, so speaking of incremental and iterative steps, um, we want to move on to kind of asking this question of what's next. So um, one of the, and, and that question is about kind of how you engage with the toolkit, how you implement, and how you think about, you know, beyond reading kind of what you will do uh, with this tool. And um, one of the ways that you can take next steps, uh, including engaging with the creators of the toolkit, um, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat here that is um, a link to our Speakers Bureau form. And this form is, uh, it's the best way to get in touch with the, uh, the entire working group. Um, and you can request some support from working group members in terms of consulting, um, workshops, and you can also register your interest in being part of the pilot that is uh, we're, we're working on creating at this point, um, which will be piloting the toolkit implementation with some farmers markets. Also want to note that we currently have a community of practice that's ongoing um, where we're working with a number of farmers market managers, including maybe some folks in this room um, who are working on implementing the toolkit at their own markets. And um, that is ongoing. So the, the, um, the applications for it are not currently open, but we're hoping that there may be other iterations in the future. So if you're interested in that, you can let us know as well, but do check out the Speakers Bureau form. Um, as we were saying, you can kind of do a deep dive um, with workshops or reach out for consulting support um, for assessing your market for many, many possible things that you may wish to do as you start to implement. Um, so beyond those kind of specific steps, we wanted to open it up now for questions um, and to invite folks also to, uh, to answer some of the questions that we've asked throughout the presentation. Um, so the questions around the conversation um, or the clip that you heard from Sharana Moore and also uh, questions around how this presentation relates to you and to your work and about your own next steps. Um, anything else that you wanted to add to that, Sadrina, before we open up for questions? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in addition to, to questions, because maybe we'd love to hear just your thoughts. Um, we um, know that this is a lot to take in. And so very interested in hearing what first impressions are. What do you feel you need to sit with? Um, what are some of the emotions and feelings that you may be processing. Um, so if you are willing to share some of those things, I think that would be helpful to the group. And you can put those in the chat, but I think you can also feel free to take yourself off mute if you'd like. Um, I can talk a little bit. Uh, I think when um, hearing this presentation and looking through the toolkit, it definitely is uh, sometimes overwhelming because there's so many other things to do uh, with market. And I think managers um, a lot of times have uh, a lot of, of, you know, job descriptions that are like from here to, to there. And um, and this isn't necessarily sometimes a people's skill set, but I, uh, I'm really grateful for um, this and uh, for Ofma continuing to do this workshop as well, just to keep people accountable. And um, it's it's always a great uh, thing to like bring back to the top of your mind. So it's like, oh yeah, this this should be in my daily thought process um, when when doing all those different random uh, job descriptions. Thank you for that, uh, Lisa. I think it is. Um, I I agree, and I think that 
I, you know, I have never run, I've never been a market manager. I've helped to start a lot of markets. I've helped to, I've consulted on the, um, on building capacity in markets and um, supported farmers and vendors in um, bringing their, their food and their, their goods and, and things like that to the market. And what I realized though, is that there's oftentimes like missed opportunities that like, that could be um, could bring additional value to the market that paying attention to some of these uh, suggestions as well as incorporating an anti-racist framework will help to actually benefit the entire experience for everyone. And so I really try to as often as possible draw attention to the fact that you know I definitely want, Black farmers to feel like they have places to sell their food and they're being supported by their community. And I want Black consumers and customers and neighbors to feel that they have a place of belonging. Um, and that is, you know, top priority. But I also want to just hold true that, that I have seen entire spaces transform when some of these things are implemented into um, the into the community and it just improves the experience for everyone. So um, I, I think that's the that's the that's kind of like the icing on the cake is that yes, it is another thing to consider, but in considering it, you can consider so much at the same time. And there's a question in the chat from Julie also that kind of uh, dovetails with what you're talking about here, Sadrina, asking for kind of specific examples of a market putting anti-racism into practice um, that have been effective. Um, I, I think you're probably the best person to speak to that. I can talk about it like a few in my own experience, but. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I can speak back to, um, the experience that we had in, and this, and I'll just kind of build on what I was saying. So we had this, um, and at least in Georgia, and I'm sure in other communities, there was a uh, two things. There was a stigma that was associated with SNAP benefits and folks that were um, receiving SNAP benefits, and there was an association with SNAP benefits um, being things that were, you know, utilized exclusively or primarily by um, people of color. And um, and that was um, a very you know racist thinking as well as um, you know problematic again for a bunch of reasons. So by addressing the fact that we knew we had the stigma and that the markets in this particular community um, had not done a lot to address that, we um, were inadvertently like letting that storytelling and that narrative be a part of the the market culture. And unfortunately, um, that meant that there were people who needed to utilize food stamps in their community that were hesitant to to access them and certainly would never consider coming to a community space to use them. So we did a um, I worked with the markets in that community, several markets, and we did a um, a video campaign um, called Snap Out of It. I think it's still on the Georgia Farmers Market Facebook page if you want to check it out. Um, but it was, um, we had three different um, Snap recipients um, tell their stories and they were, you know, um, I think very different than the assumption in terms of their you know, just their background and experience and why they were on SNAP and they shared all of that. And they also, and we also talked about the opportunity to use um, the value of using SNAP at the farmer's market, not just for this consumer, but for the entire community and the economic benefit that stays in the community. And it was just, people were very, very moved um, by that. And um, we saw a significant uptick and folks that were coming to the market to use their SNAP benefits and um, you know, being able to address health issues. We saw senior citizens being more engaged in the community um, for, at the market. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really great experience. So thank you so much. And, um, and Lexi here has a question regarding data collection and sharing that data. Um, they write that our organization has been going back and forth for years about the pros and cons 
regarding collecting demographic information from vendors during applications and asks us to elaborate on why collecting information is beneficial to markets um, and, what potential and potential conflicts that could arise. What can markets do with the demographic information to assess our, uh, how are accessible our market spaces are that can lead to policy changes? Thanks so much for that question. It's definitely something I think if you haven't checked out the measurement section and the, um, and the tools that are there, I think you're gonna find um, some strong and deep answers to this question in the toolkit as well. Um, but is there anything, Sadrina, that you would wanna share on, on measurement um, and on the, uh, on the specific question of demographic data? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, gosh, there's so many components of measurement. Um, I think that there is reasonable um, moment for pause um, when it comes to collecting demographic information. Um, I think it, what I, a good kind of best practice that I utilize when serving at markets and particular vendors would be to um, put any identifiable or demographic information that I, for you know whatever reason that I want to collect at the um, end of the survey and make it 100% optional. Um, that was one of the ways that we um, addressed that. Another thing is to explain on the survey um, or, you know, both in writing and also as people are taking the survey, like what is the purpose of this? What is it gonna be used for? Who's gonna have access to the data? How will their individual responses be um, managed and collected? And some of that will, it could matter significantly or not. Like if there's only one black vendor and that one black vendor you know, identifies as black, then everyone's gonna know that that's that person, right, at the market. So you have to kind of think about the particular situation at your market. But I think there are ways, like if we just consider, um, again, like Nina said, that folks have been over-surveyed, but what hasn't happened uh, a lot is that people have been surveyed and have um, had good outcomes that they are aware of come out of it. So we need more of that. So I think like figuring out um, what's the experience. I also, I'm a huge, huge fan of incentive-based um, surveys, especially when we're talking about farmers and vendors. And um, that is something that I think, because again, it shows value for time. It shows that you respect their, um, their knowledge and that you are having a collective experience. And, um, you know, people will do all kinds of things for, you know, it's not doesn't take a whole lot um, to to address um, that this is a collective experience that people, you know, love swag. I love good swag. Um, but I really encourage like getting using that as an opportunity to share maybe something about the market that they can um, have as a as a token of appreciation, but also bring them into the community more is a way I might approach uh, vendor surveys in particular. you um i think are are we at time here ashley <laughs> i think i, I want to um i want to kind of put a question out to the group which is just to think about the sort of like um the next steps that you're thinking about as you you know having kind of seen this presentation and been here like what are some of the things that are coming up for you as um as ideas for next steps and how you might want to move ahead in implementing um, what you've seen here and what you've read in the toolkit, if you've had a chance to read it. I can speak a little bit. Um, our farmer's market started a DEI committee um, at the beginning of last year. And our main goal was um, to have a culture audit done by the end of the year. Um, and now with that wrapping up, um, we're kind of in this like weird space of how do we process all of this and how do we implement towards a better uh, market? And uh, so like each part of this toolkit, I'm realizing we can go back through and kind of re rework the toolkit now with this new information. Um, so it's very energizing. Um, 
that these resources are here all the time. It doesn't have to just be a workshop experience. So, it's exciting. Thank you. So much to say that. I just want to mention, I love that story. And I would love to hear as, and just put this out here, as you have experiences um, that transform your market, and if the toolkit plays a role in it, we'd love to hear about, we'd love to hear those stories. So please um, share that with us. And if there's any way that we can be supportive and helpful um, as you take it further, I love hearing that you all have um, you know, you did, you took the time to do a culture audit. That's amazing. I love words like culture and audit. And when they're put together in a sentence, it's like amazing. So um, yeah, if you um, are able to share that, um, we'd love to be able to amplify your experience as well um, as we're talking about it more and give people additional ideas on how they can approach it. Um, hi, this is Mira. Um, I work for Ofma. Um, so I don't actually run a farmer's market at the moment. Um, but I like the part when you were talking about messaging and you were saying that markets, like even it, important to say as part of your mission or that this is where you're trying to get to, anti-racist market is where you're trying to get to and being open to that. Um, feedback that you will get once you start saying that, but but how important it is to say that that's the direction that you're going. And um, I would like to find out from our markets here in Oregon how many are actually who are publicly saying that and try and get like. And I think there's this fear of like we're not doing enough or we're not doing the right things or like can we say that? And maybe you could say like. Is there like some point where you get to say that you're moving and that like is coming to this workshop enough and now we can start saying that or um, not that that's an it's always taking more action, like you said, but I feel like people worry about saying that that's I, I think saying it openly that that's what you're doing and being open to the feedback is an important step to take, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Um, I, I would say it's never enough. Like there's nothing that any of us can do that will ever be enough. But I think it's also fair and important to say and to know when you're doing as much as you can. And it, as much as you can is the resources you have, the support you have, the capacity you have, you know, what's reasonable for a human to <laughs> accomplish. Um, I think, you know, a basic rule of thumb is just that you're, you know, you have as a part, that's why the mission piece is so important, because that's where we come back to, you know, when we need to recenter and we're thinking, considering what's important and what are, what actions um, stay and what things we put to this, put on the shelf. Like if this is core to who you are, your identity and your values as a market and as a community, then this is something that you will continue to apply and adjust and figure out, you know, depending upon what the needs are of the space, how you can continue to, to move the ball forward. Don't wanna hold you all too far after the end of the hour, but um, I wanna drop one more time the link for the uh, Speakers Bureau, if you'd like to get in touch with the working group members um, and get some support as you move forward in this work, um, this form is a great place to do that. Um, and to thank you all so much for, for being a part of this conversation. Yeah, thank you both so much for sharing. Uh, I particularly loved hearing how this this shaped and developed. And I feel like I got some new language in using the term iterative. I'm like, of course, that's how so much of this does. And just like, just of course, so much more, but just that piece, I feel like I've got um, just a lot of great language. 
um, moving forward. And I want to also thank everybody for being here today on the call, listening, um, interacting, and remind you that OFMA has a couple of workshops coming up as well. November 30th, there's a great one. Um, and you can see that on our website as well. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're all so thankful um, for Sadrina and Nina for being here today and sharing this. And this toolkit is amazing. And I think gives us all just a really, really great roadmap and, and step forward. So thank you everybody for being here.